return to Mexico with our whole family. You're right, Trampita. My, it didn't fit. If you have a job, be grateful and never turn down work, my father would often say. This is why I regretted not having a chance to tell him in person that in addition to working for the Santa Maria window cleaners, I would be working for Mrs. Hancock during the Christmas break. He would have been proud of me, I thought, as I left our house to go see Mrs. Margie Williams, Mrs. Hancock's personal secretary. I checked the telephone number and address that Father O'Neill had given me and called her from a payphone at the Texaco gas station on Main Street. I've been expecting your call, she said. Come right over. When I arrived, she greeted me at the door and invited me in. A sweet smell of cinnamon and peppermint filled the air. In the corner of the living room stood a large Christmas tree, crowned with an angel and strung with twinkling white, red, green, and yellow lights. Mrs. Williams was small. She had light blue eyes, short brown hair, and rosy cheeks. She introduced me to her husband, who was tall and husky. You must know our son, Ken, he said, pointing to a graduation picture on the fireplace mantel. Of course. I recognized him immediately from high school. He was a year behind me. Where is he now? He's a freshman in college, she said proudly. He remembers you, too. I talked to him over the phone last night, and he said to say hi. Please tell him hello for me next time you talk to him. I felt more at ease, knowing that their son and I knew each other. Mr. Williams put on his suit coat, said goodbye, and left for work. For an instant, the image of my father's face the last time I saw him flashed in my mind. Mrs. Williams then explained to me that Mrs. Marion Hancock had given her a list of people to whom she wished to give Christmas presents. Mrs. Williams was to purchase the gifts, and I was to deliver them for Mrs. Hancock on the weekend before Christmas. I was disappointed that the job was for only two days, but I was glad to have it. The following Saturday morning, I returned to Mrs. Williams' house, ready to begin my new job. Her living room looked like a huge treasure chest. It was filled with big and small Christmas presents, wrapped in colorful paper with different patterns and figures, stars and angels, Frosty the Snowman, starry lights, reindeers in flight, and teddy bears. She offered me a cup of hot chocolate, and after I finished it, she said, You'll be driving the company van to deliver the gifts. I was glad I wouldn't be driving our old DeSoto. I've sorted the presents by towns and neighborhoods to make it easier for you. Here's a map and a list of names with addresses. I loaded the van and delivered presents that morning to places and homes I did not know existed. The houses in Lake Marie Estates, near the Santa Maria Country Club, had large front yards with lush green lawns, trimmed hedges, lattice fences, and flower gardens. Some even had outdoor swimming pools and wide cobblestone or red brick driveways. In the pale afternoon light, I drove to Vandenberg Air Force Base near Lompoc and left gifts for military officers at the gate since I did not have clearance to enter the base. I was disappointed because I wanted to see the missile testing grounds. I used to hear the boom of rockets periodically blasting off from the base when we had picked strawberries for Ito during the summer. They shot straight up into the air through aimlessly roving clouds, leaving a long trail of white smoke. On Sunday, I picked up the van and finished the deliveries by mid-morning and returned it to Mrs. Williams. My, that was quick, she said, smiling. You did a fine job. Here's a Christmas present for you from Mrs. Hancock. She handed me a large box wrapped in light blue paper with figures of peace doves. Go ahead and open it. I carefully took off the wrapping paper, folded it, and opened the box. Inside was a beautiful dark blue and white reversible jacket with a hood attached to it. It's water repellent, she added. This was a perfect gift. I did not have a waterproof jacket or a raincoat. Thank you, I said. Please thank Mrs. Hancock for me. You can thank her yourself. She wants to meet you. I'm going to call her to see if today is good for her. Please make yourself at home. She left the room. I sat down on the couch and admired a small nativity set on the end table and listened to Christmas carols softly playing on the stereo. 
A few minutes later, she returned and said excitedly, She'll be happy to see you this afternoon. I wanted to learn something about Mrs. Hancock before going to meet her, but I was not sure if there was a proper way to ask. Taking a chance, I said, I am curious. Is Alan Hancock College in any way connected to Mrs. Hancock's name? Alan Hancock College was a two-year community college in Santa Maria where Roberto had taken woodshop classes at night to make furniture for his home after he got married. I thought you knew, she answered. When I blushed, she added, Well, there's no reason why you should. Many people don't know either. She explained that the college stood on the site of what used to be the Hancock College of Aeronautics, which Mr. Hancock had founded and where pilots trained for service during the Second World War. After the war, he leased the land to Santa Maria Junior College for one dollar a year, and when the new campus was built, it was renamed Allen Hancock College. He's a very generous man, I said. An extraordinary man. He owns and operates Rosemary Farm and the Santa Maria Valley Railroad, which runs between Santa Maria and Guadalupe. His favorite steam engine is Old 21. It's now a museum piece. Have you seen it? When we first arrived in Santa Maria from Mexico, I would watch the trains go by behind the migrant labor tent camp we lived in. Roberto and I played on the railroad tracks and waited every day at noon for the train to pass by. We always wondered where it came from. We called it the noon train. Could this be the same one? Have you seen the engine, Mrs. Williams repeated? I'm sorry, no, I haven't, but I'd like to. She proceeded to tell me that it was located near the railroad offices on South McClelland and suggested that I stop by to see it. Oh, gosh, I almost forgot. You need to be on your way. She jotted down Mrs. Hancock's address on a piece of paper and handed it to me. Rosemary Farm is easy to get to. I had seen Rosemary Farm from a distance many times. The long cluster of low, white roof buildings looked like mushrooms growing in the middle of hundreds of acres of green fields. I was amazed that Mr. and Mrs. Hancock lived there. I expected them to live in neighborhoods like the ones I had seen the past two days while delivering gifts. I know where it is, I said. We can see it from Bonetti Ranch, where my family lives. Before I left, she gave me an envelope with money in it for my work delivering presents. I opened it in the car. I was flabbergasted when I saw three fifty-dollar bills. How generous! My father and I would have had to work sixty hours each picking strawberries to earn this much. I wish I could have shared this moment with him. He would have been very pleased. The private entrance to the farm was on the west side. On both sides of the narrow paved road were small, white, wooden houses and cottages with flower gardens. They were numbered consecutively, starting with one. Mrs. Hancock's house was number ten. The facade of her house was no different from that of the other houses, except for two white, wooden pillars that framed the entrance. The rest of it was hidden from view with tall hedges and trees. I nervously rang the doorbell. Mrs. Hancock opened the door. I introduced myself. How nice to finally meet you, she said, ushering me in and motioning for me to sit next to a coffee table. She sat down across from me in a high-backed armchair. She had a soft, pleasing voice, a radiant face, sweet, almond-shaped brown eyes, and graying blonde hair pinned back in a bun with curls in the front. A string of white pearls adorned her collar. She was elegant like a swan. Behind her on the wall hung a floral tapestry with shades of black, brown, white, rose, blue, and green. On a small table next to her chair was a small sculpture of the Virgin Mary and a leather-bound copy of the Bible with gold lettering. I thanked her for the jacket and the job and gave her Father O'Neill's regards. I am so pleased he brought us together, she said, clasping her small, slender hands. Unfortunately, the captain won't be able to meet you. He's ill. The captain? I wondered to whom she was referring. I apologize. I call my husband the captain. You see, when he was a child, he was fascinated by boats. He rode a flat boat on lakes at the tar pits in Los Angeles. 
and when he got older, he designed and built several vessels. Then he got his mariner's license. Ever since, he became known in our family as Captain Hancock. I simply call him the Captain. I'm sorry he's not well, I responded. Mrs. Williams told me a little about him. He's an amazing man. He certainly is, she said. He's been a blessing to me. We'll be celebrating his 88th birthday this year. Since you won't be able to see him, I'd like to show you one of my favorite pictures of him. She stood up, went to an adjacent room, and returned with a red photo album, then showed me a photo of Mr. Hancock receiving an honorary doctorate of science degree from the University of Santa Clara in 1959. Wow, I exclaimed. I'm glad he was honored by Santa Clara. I felt proud of my school. The captain clearly seemed a leader, I thought, recalling what Father Shanks would call a leader. He had certainly lived life to its fullest extent. I knew you'd enjoy seeing it, she said, smiling. Now before you leave, I have another gift for you, she said. She left and came back with a navy blue pinstripe suit on a wooden hanger. This suit belongs to the captain. We would like you to have it. I was as surprised and moved by this gesture as I had been the time my father had given me his prized St. Christopher medal for my eighth grade graduation. He had worn it ever since I could remember. I stood up and said, Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hancock. Are you sure? I took the suit and folded it over my left arm. It was smooth like silk. It would make us happy to have you wear it. Noticing that she did not sit back down, I realized it was time for me to leave. It was a pleasure meeting you, I said. I appreciate all you've done for me. You're welcome. Please keep in touch and give my love to Father O'Neill. When I got home, I gave my mother the envelope. It's for Christmas presents for our family, I said. Gracias a Dios, mijo, she said, giving me a hug. I then showed her the jacket and the suit and explained to her who gave them to me. She looked surprised, but thankful. Como hay gente buena en el mundo, she said. There are many good people in the world. When I tried the suit on, the pants were too big in the waist, and the coat was too large in the front. It doesn't fit, I said, coming out of my room and modeling it for my mother. You're right, mijo. It's too big for you, she said with disappointment. Crossroads. The thought of not seeing my father for a long time, even in his worst moods, left a deep sorrow in my family and me. Every day my sister would wait for him on the front steps and would cry because he did not show up at the end of the day. At college, I stayed awake at night praying and thinking about what to do, stay in college or return home. I yearned to finish college but my father's absence had left a void in my family that I felt I had the responsibility to fill. Family always came first, so I felt torn. After going back and forth many times, I made the decision to withdraw from college at the end of the first semester of my sophomore year and return home. After Christmas break, I went back to Santa Clara to finish the last two weeks of classes. I was preoccupied and irritable, Smokey, sensing something was wrong, asked what was troubling me. I'm just worried about finals, I told him. I decided to let him know about my decision after final exams, because I did not want to bother him with my problems before then. I visited Father O'Neill on Friday and gave him Mrs. Hancock's regards and told him about my visit with her and the two gifts she gave me. Good, he said. I'm glad you got to meet her. She has a heart of gold. Yes, she does. When he told me I looked tired and asked if something was wrong, I shook my head and told him what had happened at home and what I had decided to do. Oh, no, I am so sorry. I can understand your feelings. He paused for a while and then added firmly, but I disagree with your decision to leave Santa Clara. But I feel responsible for my family, especially now that my father has left. Don't you think that finishing college is also your responsibility? Think of the sacrifices your family made for you to be here. 
Think of the people who believe in you and contributed to your scholarships. Don't you think you have a responsibility to them, too? Besides, remember what I told you. Everything happens for a reason, and you must have trust in God. I do have trust in God, Father, and I appreciate the sacrifices people have made for me, and I don't want to let them down, but... Look, son, I know how difficult this is for you, but I think you should take more time to reflect on your decision in light of our discussion. Meantime, I will offer novena for you and your family. The more I thought about Father O'Neill's advice, the less sure I was about my decision. That evening, I walked around the mission gardens trying to clear my mind. Was I being selfish if I stayed in college? What about my dream of being a teacher? I thought about how hard Trampita, Torito, and my mother were working to get by. I felt guilty. I returned to my room and struggled to get started on a paper for my philosophy final. I put it aside and went to bed, but had a hard time sleeping. I was so depressed and discouraged by Sunday that I did not feel like going to the first meeting for new sodality candidates that afternoon. At Smokey's insistence, I dragged myself to it and took an aisle seat in the back of the room and tried to pay attention to Father Shanks. After he welcomed us, we joined him in a prayer for the new year. He then wrote on the blackboard, What is the meaning and purpose of my life? The question held my attention because I often wondered why my family and I suffered so much. My father would say we were cursed. I want you to answer this question to yourselves, Father Shanks said, pacing up and down the room. It's not easy, but it's one we must all seek to answer. He moved to the back of the room, stood next to me, and continued. Where can we find clues in our faith and life experiences? Each one of us must reflect on our faith and life experiences and try to draw strength and meaning from them. He paused, placed his right hand on my shoulder, and explained that sometimes we would be baffled by our experiences because they did not come neatly packaged and labeled. He encouraged us not to give up and told us that the struggle was as important as finding the answer. He leaned over and whispered to me, Can you please come see me in my office after this meeting? He walked back to the front of the room, picked up the chalk, underlined the question on the board several times and said, As sodalists, I want you to wrestle with this question. Your education and the deepening of your faith here at Santa Clara will guide you in your quest. At the end of the meeting, several students went up to talk to him. I left and waited for him in the lobby outside his office in Walsh Hall. Through the glass doors to the main entrance of the building, I saw him plodding up the front stairs carrying a bundle of file folders in his left arm. I opened the door for him. Thanks, he said, catching his breath. He unlocked the door to his office and invited me in. Take a seat, he said. He dropped the folders on top of a heap of papers on his desk, sat down next to me, and lit a cigarette. What's this I hear about your leaving Santa Clara? I was surprised he knew. Father O'Neill must have told him. He must have read my mind because he said, Yes, Father O'Neill talked to me. The reason I know your reason, he said, interrupting me. Father O'Neill explained it to me, and I agree with him. I think you're making a big mistake. I know that in your culture, children are expected to live for and honor their families. I admire that. But you must also think about yourself. But you said that we have the responsibility to act as my brother's keeper. Yes, it's true. But in this case, think of the long-term consequences. Don't you think that you would be in a better position to help your family once you finish college and become a teacher? It's a sacrifice you're making now to fashion a better future for your family, yourself, and others like you. Don't you agree? It makes sense, I paused. I'd like to think more about it. I felt pain in the back of my neck and shoulders. I agree. You should take more time to reflect on it. I'm confident you'll make the right decision. 
After I left his office, I went to the mission church. It was empty and silent. I knelt down before the painting of St. Francis at the cross and prayed. Perhaps I shouldn't have mentioned anything to Father O'Neill about it, but out of respect, I had had to tell him. He was my friend, and I trusted him. Oh, it would be so much easier if someone would just make the decision for me. I got up and sat down in the front pew and looked at the painting of St. Anthony adoring the Christ child that was to the right of the altar. The Christ child figure seemed so pure and peaceful. I went up to the side of the altar, lit a candle, and said a Hail Mary. I returned to my room and wrote down more memories of my childhood, keeping in mind what Father Shanks had said about finding purpose and meaning to our lives. I wrote about Torito, who almost died from an illness he contracted during the time we lived in Tent City. He was a few months old when he began suffering convulsions and diarrhea. My parents gave him mint tea, prayed, and consulted a curandera, a healer, who rubbed raw eggs on his stomach. When he got worse, my parents finally took him to the county hospital, even though they had no money to pay for medical care. The doctor told my parents that Torito was going to die. My parents refused to believe the doctor. They brought Torito home, and our whole family prayed every day to El Santo Niño de Atocha, the little baby Jesus, until my brother got well. I put my notes aside and went over the assignment for my philosophy class. We were to write a short essay on one of the works we read in the course and relate it to our lives. I chose The Allegory of the Cave in Plato's Republic. I compared my childhood of growing up in a family of migrant workers with the prisoners who were in a dark cave chained to the floor and facing a blank wall. I wrote that, like the captives, my family and other migrant workers were shackled to the fields day after day, seven days a week, week after week, being paid very little and living in tents or old garages that had dirt floors, no indoor plumbing, no electricity. I described how the daily struggle to simply put food on our tables kept us from breaking the shackles, from turning our lives around. I explained that faith and hope for a better life kept us going. I identified with a prisoner who managed to escape and with his sense of obligation to return to the cave and help others to break free. After finishing the paper, I thought about Father Shanks's question and the advice he and Father O'Neill had given me. They were right. I had to sacrifice and finish college.